Welcome to Online Church here at St Jude's for this 10th Sunday after Trinity. My name is Andrew Schmidt. We're nearly at the end of our long journey through the letter to the Hebrews and today's message is an absolute highlight as we're taken to the mountain of joy, the heavenly Zion, where everyone who trusts in Christ is gathered. I hope it will spur you on this week. At St Jude's we have a vision to fill the church with disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's because the message of salvation that the Lord Jesus brings is not merely for some, it's not merely for those who might be culturally Christian or even culturally Anglican. It's for everyone because God has made every human being in his image and his love in Christ is for the whole world. I believe that God can fill our church, which seats 400 at least outside COVID season, at least three times a Sunday and maybe more from the thousands living in Randwick who need to hear of God's love. Please join in praying that God would do this. And do join us in person whenever you feel ready at 10 a.m. in the church or 6 p.m. in the parish room. We also meet live online at 8 a.m. every Sunday. See the church website for details about how to join. Don't forget that we would love you to get in touch through our online connect card which you can find through the link which is in the description of this video on YouTube. Let's go into church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your mind, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us, 
Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. for the 20th Ordinary Sunday. God our Father, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass man's understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The epistle reading is taken from Hebrews, chapter 12, beginning at verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who wanted them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At the time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 67. Let God be gracious to us and bless us. 
and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your liberating power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing, for you judge the peoples with integrity and govern the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth will yield its fruitfulness, and God, our God, will bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 32. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water, to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, who suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, who he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
harder and harder, I think, in our world of 24-hour everything, constant bombardment with content, everything glossy, everything new and improved, it's harder and harder to grab people's attention and to keep it. It's hard to bring about a feeling of awe. Preachers love to complain that the word awesome has really lost its meaning because these days any experience that produces just a slight bump on the happiness meter is called awesome. But the writer of Hebrews aims in this passage to fill us with a true sense of awe in order to motivate us to the service of God. So I want you to enter with me into matters which are awesome in the true sense of the word. The gathering at Mount Sinai would have been awesome in that truest sense, wouldn't it? Sinai was where ancient Israel made their covenant with God. God, in his promise-keeping love, had rescued them from their slave masters in Egypt, defeated the Egyptians magnificently, and led his people to the mountain to make a covenant. God and Israel would make promises to each other. Israel would promise to obey God, which could hardly be a burden considering the wonderful salvation he had just wrought for them. And God would promise that of all the nations in the world, Israel would be his treasured possession, his special people. What an occasion this was. It was a little like a wedding. The joining of God and his special people. A wedding I once attended was uh, the reception that was held in a complex at Darling Harbour and there were several function rooms side by side. Well, the wedding in the function room next door to us had the police called at around about 9pm and suddenly all of the guests left. The place was left deserted, dark and quiet. It must have been so depressing for the family who had thrown that party. It was a horror wedding. The making of the covenant at Mount Sinai was a bit like a horror wedding. The joyful atmosphere that you would anticipate at a wedding just wasn't there. In fact, it was a fearful gathering. Listen to Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Verse 18, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. Hebrews refer to these events in chapter 12, verse 18. A mountain burning with fire, darkness, gloom and storm, a trumpet blast. The people were terrified by all of this. After God had spoken the Ten Commandments to them, they said to Moses, please do not have God speak to us anymore or we will die. As Hebrews puts it, they begged that no further word be spoken. And they had good reason. This was a terrifying gathering with a terrifying voice. But now, Hebrews says, here is the good news for all Christian believers. That is not the mountain to which you have come. If you have put your faith in Christ, you have not come to the fearful gathering of Mount Sinai. You have come, verse 22, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. We have also come to a mountain, he explains here, but instead of a mountain speaking fear and condemnation, it's a joyful mountain. The mountain to which Christians have come is a mountain of joy. The angels in joyful assembly, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. 
the praises of God the Saviour being sung in perfect harmony. This is the joyful gathering you would have hoped that Mount Sinai might have been. This is a joyful gathering so much better than even the most perfect wedding. Christians have come to this mountain. By faith and through the Spirit, we are there now already. Right now, through Christ, we have peace with God and access to God, which we express through prayer and praise. Right now, we are securely in God's presence because our names are written in heaven. When we die and go to heaven, that will be when we fully experience what is already a spiritual reality for us. As Christians, we have come to the joyful mountain. So the question is, what has made the difference? Why is it possible for Christians to have gathered before God with joy and celebration, whereas ancient Israel gathered in fear and gloom? First of all, let me tell you what it certainly is not. It is not that God has changed. It is not that God has lightened up a bit and decided not to be so angry. It's not that there's been some development in thinking about God so that we've gotten away from the, the primitive, wrathful God of the Old Testament. It's not anything like that. God has not changed. The difference is what God has achieved for us through the blood of Christ. Verse 24, we have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Do you remember the blood of Abel and the word it spoke? It cried out to God from the ground, crying out for vengeance against Cain, Abel's brother, who had killed him. But the sprinkled blood of Jesus speaks a better word because it purifies us from sin and it speaks of free access to God. It's a new covenant. It's a better word. It's normal, isn't it, when people are gathered that there be an address. Someone speaks to the gathering. When Israel gathered at Mount Sinai, God spoke to them. And at the mountain of joy, God speaks to his people. So it's no accident that in our regular gatherings, God speaks by means of his word being read and explained. When God's people gather, it is to hear God speak. And what does God say? Well, everything in scripture, of course. But fundamentally, the word that God speaks to his gathered people is the better word, the word of grace and forgiveness and joyful access to God through the blood of Christ. The gathering of Christian people is a better gathering, which hears a better word. So, verse 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. This is the warning. When we hear the better word that God addresses to us under the new covenant, let us make sure we don't refuse him. The Sinai generation had said, we don't want to hear. It's not safe. Moses, please stop God speaking to us or we will die. They refused to hear God speak. Now, as we've seen it, it wasn't wrong of them to ask Moses to be their mediator, to be their go-between. But... The way that they refused God's voice at Mount Sinai turned out to be an eerie foreshadowing of the way that God's people would refuse God's voice all the way through their sad history. They were given God's word and they simply didn't believe or obey it. And they did not escape God's condemnation. Now, if it was bad for those who refused God's terrifying words at Mount Sinai, what do you think it will be like for those who refuse God's better word of forgiveness and grace at the heavenly Zion? If you refuse the better word, will it be better for you or worse? Well, look at what verse 25 goes on to say. 
For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? You see, it will be worse. Do you see why? Because God has not merely revealed his wrath as he did at Mount Sinai. But he's gone beyond that by offering up his own son in payment of his wrath. God has reached into his treasury and given us the most valuable gift he could possibly give us. The forgiveness and the openness and the joy of the, the joyful mountain are a precious gift bought at the greatest cost. Why would we refuse it? Well, for some, this better word spoken through Christ is still not good enough. And generally, because what they want is a word that has no judgment and no sin, no need for Jesus' death, no repentance. A God who would be no cause at all for all. But the fact is, even if you did want a God like that and a word of God, like that, a word of no accountability, no change, no awe. It just doesn't exist. The God who is there is the terrifyingly holy God who can only be accessed by the precious blood of his son, whom he put forward as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The better word spoken by the blood of Christ is the best word that God has to say. There is no other word from God. If we refuse this word, then not only do we refuse the only possible rescue from God's judgment for our sins, but we add to our sins by refusing God's most precious gift. That is the greatest possible insult to our maker. And that is why, for those who refuse God's better word, it will be even worse. So let us not refuse him who speaks. For that same voice which shook Mount Sinai will in the future shake the whole creation. Verse 26, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. In the last battle, the last book of C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, he gives a great illustration of the power of God's voice. Aslan calls time, and the giant father time reaches out his hand grabs the sun and squeezes it like an orange. In these verses, Hebrews really takes us to the end of the present age when God calls time on this heaven and earth. Lewis is right. His voice will squeeze the sun like an orange. And that is the same voice that addresses us in the Bible. Don't refuse it. Because beyond the end, after God has called time on this heavens and earth, he has something in store for us. He will give us a kingdom. To receive a kingdom means nothing less than to be made kings and queens. So we are to rule with Christ a kingdom beyond the ends of this heaven and earth. A kingdom centered on that mountain where myriads of angels are gathered joyfully. Now that is certainly good reason to be thankful to God. As verse 28 says, let us be thankful that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Are you thankful to God for receiving this kingdom? Please say in your heart, thank you, Father, for granting me a share in ruling this kingdom that cannot be shaken. It is the most amazing thing to have been showered with such favour, such blessing by God. This really stirs my heart. That the kingdom we will rule together is the ultimate benefit of Jesus' work on the cross. 
If the cross is the expression of God's love, the kingdom is the enjoyment of God's love. So let us be thankful, says verse 28, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So with the knowledge that we've already come to the joyful mountain, and the promise of this kingdom that we're receiving, our thankfulness to God flows out into reverent service. Literally, it says that our worship, our service of God, is to come by means of thankfulness. The idea is that our thankfulness is to be what drives our service to God. Are you thankful to God? If so, it won't be surprising to see you serving him with reverence and awe. If you're not thankful to God, well, it may be difficult to serve him. To worship here in verse 28 really just means to serve. Serving God means presenting ourselves to him, saying, what would you like me to do? And being prepared to do whatever he says. That's serving God. That's worship. Simply presenting ourselves to God and saying, at your service. When we come to his word in the Bible, we have to be prepared for it to say whatever it will say. And if we do, then we'll be serving God according to what he actually says. Our service, it says, should be acceptable or pleasing. Isn't it great to know that we can bring pleasure to God by our service? It also says that our service should be with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. God in himself has not changed, you see. He is still the consuming fire of whom the Israelites were terrified at Mount Sinai. It's just that because of his grace in Christ, we don't need to be terrified anymore. The word translated awe here is a very strong word meaning dread. It is appropriate to have a healthy fear of God, mixed with the knowledge of his amazing grace to us in Christ. You know, you can have both. A deep fear of God and a secure knowledge of his goodness to us through his Son. It's possible to have both of those things, just like a drink which is full of sweetness and yet also has a zing of sourness that makes you shudder. This mixture of attitudes to God should exhilarate us to serve him reverently. Next week, chapter 13 begins to give us a grab bag of ways to serve God pleasingly. But today I hope we've been given the motivation for serving and, for, and been given a deeper understanding of what that service is. It, it is bending our wishes to the will of our master. He has been so good to us, hasn't he? Through his son, we have come to a better gathering to hear a better word, a word of grace. So let us not refuse it. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much that the blood of Christ makes it possible for us to be gathered at the joyful mountain where without fear, and with great joy and free access to you, we will rejoice with the angels in festal gathering. Thank you, Father, that through faith and by your spirit, we who trust in you are there gathered at that mountain already. And so, Father, in light of this, please help us to serve you with reverence and awe. And we pray in your son's name. Amen. Please join me for a time of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we draw near to you now, knowing that you hear us and love us, and that you are mighty and merciful to answer our prayers. Please teach us more of what it means to trust you this day, and to live our lives in joyful obedience to Jesus, our Saviour and King. Our loving God, we know that you have made all people in your image, and that you care for the poor and distressed, the downtrodden and overlooked. And we thank you, Father, for the many organisations that seek to provide Christian compassion and care 
to those who most need it in our society. And we especially pray for Anglicare today. Please bless and prosper the good work Anglicare is doing among the most vulnerable people in our communities. Empower their workers and volunteers by your spirit in all that they undertake, that they might demonstrate Christ's love in all they do and say. We also pray, Father, for those in our midst and our communities who live with various disabilities and face additional challenges and complexities in their lives. We thank you, Father, that you know and love each one and that each is precious in your sight. Please give them opportunities to use their gifts and skills in the places they find themselves and to access the help and support they need. We also pray that you would supply strength, patience and kindness to those who care for them in various ways. Our God of compassion and mercy, as we all navigate through this difficult COVID season, we ask that you would especially be providing for those who have lost jobs and are struggling to find meaningful employment at this time. Please give your strength and peace to all who are unemployed and living in fear or worry about the future. Please provide a way for all those in need of your help and empower Christians with a spirit of generosity and sacrificial love that we may all look for opportunities to help and care for our neighbour. Lord God, we thank you for the St Jude's Early Learning Centre and the wonderful presence it has here in our Randwick community. Please bless all who are involved in the centre, the educators, families, the committee and the children, so that it may continue to be a place where the children can flourish and grow with loving care and instruction. We pray that you might bless our efforts to connect with more of the families, asking that they may all feel welcome here at St Jude's and would grow in their awareness of your love for them through Christ. Today we also pray, Father, for the family and friends of John Clark, who we remember with the flowers in the memorial vase. We thank you for his life, and we pray for your comfort and peace to especially be with Maureen and all who knew and loved John. May the certain hope of our eternal inheritance through Christ provide assurance and comfort in the midst of sadness and grief. And Lord, we also ask for your compassion and care to be with the Lohman family at this time, especially with Emma, Tim, Toby and Lucy, and all who grieve the loss of loved ones and who struggle with the pains of this world. Father, you know the burdens that we carry and the trials that we face, yet we can confidently declare that not even these can separate us from your love. Please strengthen us with that knowledge today so that we may continue running the race with perseverance, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, and in whose name we pray. Amen. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ has promised that you will hear us when we ask in faith, receive the prayers we offer. We pray for the peace of the world and the welfare of your holy church. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our Archbishop Glenn, our Bishop Michael, our Rector Andrew, and for all the clergy and people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray that we may share with justice the resources of the earth and live in trust and goodwill with one another. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the aged and the infirm, for widows and orphans, and for the sick and suffering. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the poor and oppressed, for prisoners and captives, and for all who care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves and for each other. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We praise you, Lord God, for the communion of saints and for the glorious hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us prepare to share in the Lord's Supper together. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Let us pray together. We, we do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. during the week. Blessed are you, Lord God our Father. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed, Blessed be God, God forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. All honour, glory, and thanks and praise be given to you at all times and in all places, Lord, Holy Father, true and living God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is your eternal word, through whom you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. In your great love, you gave him to be made human for us, and to share our common life. In obedience to your will, your Son, our Saviour, offered himself as a perfect sacrifice and died upon the cross for our redemption. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin and reconciled us to yourself. 
our God and Father. He is our great high priest, whom you raised from death and exalted to your right hand on high, where he ever lives to intercede for us. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a royal priesthood called to serve you forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. to our Saviour Christ, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his body and his blood, who, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, He took the cup, and again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. this bread and this cup, we do as our Saviour has commanded. We celebrate the redemption he has won for us. We proclaim his perfect sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and we look for his coming to fulfill all things according to your will. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom by the power of the Holy Spirit we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of never-ending praise.
in remembrance that Christ's body was broken for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Father, we thank you that you feed us who have received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the body and blood of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this assurance of your goodness and love, and that we are living members of his body and heirs of his eternal kingdom. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and help us to grow in love and obedience that with all your saints we may worship you forever. Father, Father, we we offer offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of God.